Well, uh, we'll get going right at the top of the hour since you guys all came on time and uh, Susan and Tom and Tim are here. So, uh, and we're already started recording. Thank you, Jill. So, hey, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Ruth Abbey from Northern California Recycling Association, and you're here because you are participating in our carton and aseptic recycling uh, webinar and roundtable. And I'm gonna get uh, started. Uh, we are um, doing a little housekeeping. We're recording. So if you do not want to be recorded, just you know, turn off your, um, turn off your video. And uh, when you're not talking, go ahead and mute uh, your audio so we don't have the barking dogs or um, uh, crashing waves in Hawaii. And then, um, but go ahead and put your comments or questions for the speakers in the chat. We will have this video recording available up on our website, nickrecycles.org. And, um, you know, we're really hoping to get a, a dialogue going today. So when it's time to open it up to the round table, please go ahead and raise your hand if you want to be recognized and unmute. Um, we want to have a lively discussion. So this is our agenda. We're going to do a brief introduction, and then we're going to have Susan Robinson and Tom right here from the Carton Council, and they're going to be doing a Carton Council recycling update. And then T Tim Dewey Matia from Napa Recycling, who is also on the Nickel Recycle Northern California Recycling Association board, will be talking about cart recycling in the North Bay. Then we'll open it up to a roundtable discussion, and we've invited several folks that um, are processors, recyclers, you know, people involved in uh, recycling, who um, uh, you know will give them the opportunity to weigh in on the opportunities and challenges in carton and aseptic recycling. And then we just have a little bit of announcements and next steps at the end. You are invited here by the NICRA Zero Waste Schools Committee. And this is not really a schools discussion, but I'll tell you why we invited you. Um, so our, our, our team um, meets regularly. We have, um, we have webinars. We've had 13 so far the last year and a half and um, have really been trying to focus on helping schools recycle and compost, particularly in support of SB 1383 and um, 1826 and other uh, recycling requirements. And it's a little bit tricky to recycle and compost at schools. And so it's been really helpful to have a, a dialogue across the state and in Northern California on some of these key issues. Why schools and cartons? Well, cartons represent a relatively small portion of the overall material stream that we throw away, recycle, and compost um, around the state, maybe 1% or less. Um, but they represent a large portion of our school community's um, uh, outthrows. And, um, and uh, you know, here locally in the Northern California, folks, you know, have a hard time. You know, are they supposed to go in the recycling? Are they supposed to go in the compost? Do they put them in the landfill? And in actuality, they're going everywhere. And so we we're really um, excited to have uh, Susan and Tom and Tim here to kind of lay it out uh, uh, all out for us. What are the opportunities? And then when we get to the discussions of what's going on in our communities, um, you know, we can then kind of talk about what are the challenges that we can help overcome because the schools are kind of wagging that dog of the communities. So if the communities are not asking their recyclers and processors to uh, separate cartons for recycling, it will have a hard time at the school site level to do this. So that's why we invited you here from the schools committee, but we're, we're this is bigger than just schools. We asked you to fill out a, um, a questionnaire ahead of time and 14 of you did. Uh, just to say, what do, what stream does the milk carton go in for your school or your district or your where you are? And um, as you can see, it's all over. They go in the recycling, they go in the compost a little bit, and the landfill a large chunk, and then it varies depending on location. Same thing for aseptics. We don't put those in the compost. However, we do see them in the recycling, we see them in the landfill. So uh, that's really why we invited you here. And now to give us kind of an update, I'm going to turn it over to Susan and ask you to go ahead and share your screen, Susan, and tell us uh, what are the opportunities in carton and aseptic recycling. Awesome. Thank you. As I pull up my, let's see here, share screen. I want to just tag on what Ruth said. I'm My presentation today is not so much about schools, but if we aren't tackling cartons from, at MRFs and in communities, we can't recycle in the schools. So I, if you could think about that context, are you seeing my screen right now? 
Yes. It looks good. Okay, great. So think about the context for that, that we're having, we're really working hard to make sure that we are recycling cartons in communities across the state. And as those systems are in place systematically, that it makes us easier to tackle those school recycling programs. So you're, we can talk more about that. You're gonna hear me really talk about this though from the system-wide program um, and the community and MRF collection and collection and processing and marketing perspective here. So do me a favor, if I have something wonky, I'm just getting used to running off of my own personal computer. I'm not very good at it. So if something goes haywire, let me know and I'll see if I can fix it really quick. I'm not used to not having a corporation behind me helping me out here a little bit. So hopefully this will be okay. So first of all, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity today. One of the things as I've been working on carton recycling, um, I started out 30 years ago doing carton recycling work, and since then I've had a variety of um, professions along the way um, and that have touched on carton recycling. And I've been really interested as I've been working with the Carton Council for the last year now at uh, the confusion. And the, I'm going to say the hangover um, baggage that we carry from past experiences with carton recycling that inhibit us from moving forward and using current data and current technology to be able to do more better with carton recycling in particular. And so I want to bring a couple of um, conversations to you today that we're seeing and um, uh, you know, really address some of the concerns we've heard over markets, volume, processing, and quite frankly, general hassle factor around dealing with cartons. Uh, the evolution has evolved, and our goal today is really just to give you some good information. Hopefully, you'll see it as the factual information that we can use to help make informed decisions. So first of all, what are we talking about? We're talking about gable top milk cartons, and we're talking about aseptic square cartons, the milk cartons are about 80% paper with very long fibers and about 20% layers of polyethylene. The cartons, the aseptic cartons are about 74% long fiber paper and 22% uh, layers of polyethylene with a 4% layer of aluminum. That makes that last, that mixture of the aluminum polyethylene paper makes the cart stable, the carton stable which is really important because it, it reduces the environmental impacts, not needing refrigeration, significant reduction, as well as having a health benefit globally in developing countries with a lack of need for refrigeration. It's important to note that cartons don't, are, don't have wax, they're not waxy. And we're also not talking about frozen food containers. We're really talking about um, the, the milk type cartons, gable top and the, um, uh, cart the juice cartons, the aseptic cartons. Uh, real quickly, what, who is the Carton Council? It's the trade organization made up of four of the leading companies that make the cartons. They're not the producers of the product, they're the companies that make the actual packaging itself. Um, and the Carton Council exists specifically to increase access for recycling gable top and aseptic cartons to decrease what goes into landfills or becomes litter. So our goal, like your goal, is to get more materials out of landfills and into recycling programs. That is purely our charge. Um, since the Carton Council was formed about 15 years ago, access to carton recycling has increased from 18 to 62% today, which is why you see the recycling logo on the um, gable top and the aseptic cartons. And also during that time, the recycling rate for the containers has increased to 20% nationally. In California, after a decade, decades actually, of community efforts, over 70% of the population currently has access to carton recycling. It's mostly in the larger cities of the state, as well as those really more urban areas around those large cities. So the more populated areas of the state are really where we see access to carton recycling happening. So um, I think Ruth started out, she mentioned this, that they make up a relatively small portion of the waste stream. It's, it's less than 1%. I think it's about half a percent of the waste stream, but they're very popular. I would bet that most of us buy products made in either cart containers or cartons, uh, the gable tops or the aseptics. In California, there are 70,000 tons of cartons generated each year. And we're working to divert all of those from the landfill. That translates to about 10 and a half pounds per household per year. And right now about 14,000 tons are being recycled in California. So we have a lot of room to grow. 
lot of opportunity to do more. Um, and having the MRFs and the cities support this effort is going to help a lot. So now I'm going to start to jump in and try to address some of the concerns that we've heard that have been really impediments to growing recycling programs for this material. I'm going to start where I like to start, which is with end markets. We don't have end markets. We can't recycle something. It's nothing, if that's something we haven't learned over the years, it's the most important thing of all. Um, and this comes up as a concern um, frequently as an impediment to carton recycling. Like just about every other recyclable material out there, there are bumps along the road as we've added the material to recycling programs. Um, many of us might remember growing pains when plastics first started being collected in curbside programs in the 90s. Um, glass is kind of a persistent problem, quite frankly, across the country. And even mixed paper, even as recently as the last year, we find places that have had a really hard time moving mixed paper to end markets. Because recyclables are commodities, that's not, the supply and demand will always fluctuate. But especially for commodities that are relatively new to the recycling marketplace or small volume, the marketplace imbalances can be really, really problematic. So a couple of notes about this slide in particular. Um, cartons are being, being, they're being handled in two fundamentally different ways in terms of going to market. Um, about two thirds of them get bailed along with mixed waste paper and they get sold in a grade, what we call grade 54 bail to end markets along with paper. And those go to both export and domestic mills. Cartons that are about the other third are being sorted into grade 52 bales and those are being sold primarily to North American markets. The list of markets you see on this slide is current. As I said, about 30% of the cartons are being going into that separated, the MRFs are separating them into a grade 52, and those are going to markets. Um, in, actually from California, the cartons in grade 52 um, from the Bay Area and Southern California are almost all going to Mexico. There are a few that are going export, but primarily this material is going to Mexico where it's being made into tissue and talon products. There are more markets in the Midwest um, for that grade 52. And then yesterday, I actually had the privilege, I spent the entire day at a mill in the Pacific Northwest, where they take cartons now from um, communities as part of the mixed paper, but they're actually running trials to create a grade 52 market, an additional market in, on the West Coast for grade 52 bales. So I think the point of this is we've seen there are multiple markets, as one of my bosses used to say, one market does not a market make. There are multiple markets indeed for these materials and they are growing consistently over time. Uh, this is a letter, these are two letters. These are actually submitted as part of an Oregon process that I'm gonna talk about in a few minutes. Um, these are letters, one from a broker who buys the material, basically saying, yeah, I buy this material and I sell it, no problem. The other is from Kimberly Clark in Mexico that's buying California's material. Um, and they're saying, yeah, we're using this material, we like it. It's actually interesting, I learned yesterday, it's a, it's a really valuable commodity and that long fiber, I've heard it for years, but they really were talking about how important that is to their process. Here's just a map that kind of gives an overview of where those markets are. Okay, now let's move upstream. Upstream, I think, is where we start to get into some of the sticky wickets that we're seeing, I think, in um, on the West Coast as we're really trying to grow and expand our markets for um, carton recycle, or our carton recycling programs. Um, first, I'm going to start talking about cartons when they're sorted in grade 52 bales. So that means that when it comes in, it's easy to collect in a cart. They're, you know, it's hard to hard to argue that cartons can't go in a recycling cart. But when they come into the MRF, then the question is, do you try to sort them along with another grade? Or do you put in the labor and the technology to try to sort the material out into a separate carton to sell it to those grade 52 bales? So there's been a real hesitancy in by MRFs to put in the equipment and the time and the hassle, it really is a hassle factor to sort that material into a separate grade 52 bale. This has been primarily because of low volume, as Ruth alluded to, the cost to sort the cartons compared to their value and labor shortages. All understandable. However, I will say the Carton Council has worked really hard and has been committed to helping to reduce, to help solve all these problems, starting with helping to reduce the cost of equipment to make it easier for MRFs to invest in carton processing equipment without, you know, and reducing their cost thus of processing. The MRFs that are sorting in sorting cartons into grade 52 now, I think all have 
funding from the Carton Council that's helped to offset the cost of that equipment. Each MRF sorts cart up a little differently. As somebody said once to me, the snowflake effect, um, but they mostly seem to pull them off the container residual line um, and then bail them, allowing the equipment to catch, uh, capture actually other materials well, like aluminum, uh, P PET or polypropylene, kind of the quality sorting for that container residual line. As far as volume, large MRFs sell between one and three loads of the grade 52 bales each month enough to move the material through consistently, which has been another concern. And the Carton Council has helped to develop those less than truckload shipping options for smaller to mid-sized MRFs, which Tim's gonna address in a little bit. He's done a lot of really good work to help keep that material moving. Next, then let's switch gears and talk about those cartons that get sold along with mixed paper. That's about two thirds of the cartons on the West Coast, just to be clear. So it's a large, it's not an insignificant amount of material that's moving through being sold in mixed paper. I will say I have not talked to a single MRF who is bailing cartons with their mixed paper who has had any pushback from their mill customers about the cartons in their bales on an ongoing process. Over the last year, during my conversations, not a single one. We recognize that gable top and aseptic cartons are a small portion of the waste stream, but they're growing as non-milk products and juices increase, non-dairy products, I guess I should say, over time though, recycling markets have developed and technology advancements are allowing for a lot more efficient processing. So now I am going to switch gears and I'm gonna talk about um, kind of an, I'd say um, it's, a top, it's a topic of conversation coming to you if it's not already here. It's uh, we're in the thick of it in Oregon right now, it's yield. Um, yield is the amount of material in a package that actually ends up being recycled into a new product. This percentage is front and center in Oregon right now. They're in the thick of implementing their new EPR programs. And part of that includes developing one statewide list for recyclables. What has to be on the list and what can't be on the list. DEQ in Oregon will be defining what that looks like. The yield discussion is really interesting and it is being used to help create that list. So I started by doing a little research after this came up on one of the calls, and I found it was really helpful to put the recycling yield percentages in context with the other manufacturing processes for virgin materials. So if you go to like a lean production, Six Sigma, I guess they are, you know, dialogue, they're looking at an 85% overall yield for really good processes for yield in a well-run, efficient system. Well, obviously, recycled materials are going to be less than that. As an example, magazines are quite a bit lower, um, something we've always considered to be highly recyclable, but they have a lot of clay content in them. So it's really interesting when you get to yield, magazines have a quite low yield because of that clay content. Carton yield varies by whether it's in, um, being sorted into grade 52 or whether it's in the mixed paper, but ranges from 50 as a low to 100% as a high. And in fact, the yield in particular for grade 52 is better than many types of plastics and many types of papers. Oregon DEQ is requiring a 60% yield in order for something to be considered recyclable. They are assuming that cartons in their state will be sorted to a grade 52 at the MRFs in the state, which means that because the yield for grade 52 for cartons is in the 80 to 90% range, those have been included. DEQ is including that material in their statewide list. So cartons will be, at this point, cartons are looking like they will be included in all um, residential single um, commingled recycling programs in the state of Oregon beginning in 2025. So then sticking with my Oregon discussion, because they really have a lot going on there. Um, the information on this slide was taken from a presentation that Oregon DEQ staff gave when they were presenting why they included cartons in their statewide list. For their analysis, they looked, they, they and their multiple consultants looked at the cost, the direct cost of landfilling, processing, collection, and transporting each material to disposal or recycling. And they compared that then to the indirect costs, which includes the cost to society and the environment, from the full life cycle impact of these materials. Their analysis done by three different types of consultants and, and their staff all working together basically shows that the net benefits of processing cartons for recycling outweighs the cost by 40 to 80 percent. Net, if I said that right, the net benefits it outweighs the cost, the, the cost by 40 to 80 percent. 
They just published their full report last week and I read it on Tuesday. It's great. And I'll give Ruth the link to it if anybody's interested in it. It validates this. It has a more specific number of like $2 million of a net benefit while this is more of a range. Um, but nonetheless, it validates the notion that there's a net benefit when you factor in the complexities of carton recycling um, to recycling cartons. For those of you who aren't familiar with the work that Oregon's doing, while I will say not everybody always loves what they come up with at the end of the day, I think you'd be hard pressed to find anybody who distrust their process and the integrity of the work that they're doing to evaluate their materials. It's actually quite impressive. So I'm just gonna really quickly move. Contamination is real, contamination is ongoing. We will always be working, all of us, to reduce contamination in our recycling programs. We understand that. To support government and recyclers, the Carton Council has developed some great public education materials to help minimize concerns. We have a lot of different grants offered, um, available. There's one right now available for community programs. I believe it's $5,000 if anybody's interested. And there's also links here on this slide to some of that public education. As I wind down and start to think about handing it off to Tim, I've got two more slides. First one here, just kind of a summary. As I said earlier, most large cities on the West Coast and in California, as well as those suburban areas are including cartons in their curbside programs. 70% of the state of California's population has access to carton recycling. Two thirds of the cartons in California are being recycled and sold along with mixed paper. While this is working fine, Carton Council is offering grants to recyclers who would separate them into those grade 52 bales that we've talked about previously and that Tim's gonna talk about in a minute. And there are still roughly 57,000 tons of cartons in the waste stream that we are all hoping that we can get help from everybody to recover. So economic support for all of this. For over a decade, the Carton Council has made funding available to offset the capital cost of equipment to sort tabletop and aseptic cartons in the grade 52. They've been extremely consistent. Probably of any producer out there, they've been the most consistent in this. There currently are a little more than a half a dozen mid-sized to large MRFs in the state that are using this equipment um, to, that's been purchased um, with help from the Carton Council. And there are right now several MRFs that are in the process of obtaining grant funding to add the equipment to their facilities. We really like to see the numbers increase and would love to talk to any of you that are thinking that would be interested in grant funding for, for MRFs for your communities. Before I turn it over to Tim, I just have to have a personal comment to end with. As I said, I started working on carton recycling programs early in my career when I was a consultant. We helped implement programs in California and Washington State in the early 1990s. It was really messy. It was a very messy process, but I really was supportive of it because this package is a good package for the environment and for public health benefits worldwide. So we're always weighing all sorts of different things here. Over the course of my, subsequently over the course of my career, I've seen the ups and downs of adding new packages to recycling programs. And I've actually been on both sides of the equation. I've pushed to get everything in. I'm probably personally responsible for some pretty horrible materials that have ended up in recycling programs. And I've also worked to try to keep some of the marginal materials out on the, um, over the last decade or so as we kind of understood the economics a little better. But in the past year, the work that's been done in Oregon, their staff and their consultants have actually kind of shifted, I think, the dialogue here. They, it's the first time they've taken the time to really prove the net environmental, economic, and uh, environmental, economic and environmental impacts of carton recycling and social impacts. Based on this information, I think it's time. We need to discard that past decision-making process and to reference the data as we make decisions. If our goal is to reduce the environmental impact of the materials that we manage and to divert more material from landfill, we have to make the effort to get past the easy stuff, which we've done for the most part. And now it's time to include cartons in our curbside recycling programs. So that's what I got. I've got this, I've got um, please outreach. And then uh, personally, my own, I um, make sure that you have my own email address and phone number. And with that, I think unless there's a reason to stay on this, what I'd like to do is stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Tim. Yeah, thanks so much, Susan, that's perfect. So we do have some questions coming up here in the chat. And if, if uh, you or Tom 
could address some of those in the chat, then we'll, you know, we'll open up to the questions at the end for, that uh, sounds good. for everybody. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. Yeah, we'll do that in the chat. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Tim. And if we can't get these done adequately, what, what I might suggest really quickly, if we can as Tim pulls this up, if we can't answer these adequately in the chat, what we could do is if we could get a snapshot of these, I'll figure out how to get a, a screenshot of these questions and then we can sub, we can prepare something that would be actually a, a, a good full response. We'll do that. All right. Great. Take it away, Tim. We can see your slides. You can go in um, slash slideshow slideshow mode if you want to. Otherwise, it looks fine. Oh, is it not in slideshow? Right now we're just oh. seeing it with the, the slides on the side. No big deal. But if you wanted to go slideshow mode. I tried to. I'm just going with this. Just go it's, with this. It's in, sli it's, a, it's in slideshow mode. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> okay, good. Looks, <laughs> um, looks good. Looks good. Anyway, um, so thank you. And thanks for the overview, Susan. And um, so just kind of brief intro on who we are. And I'll talk about our um, experience recycling cartons. Um, and then I think we'll kind of talk about kind of answering questions and stuff after that. Um, so we are the hauler and the um, recycling and composter in Napa. Um, we're a private company, but we have an exclusive franchise agreement with City of Napa and Napa County. And we also operate the City of Napa's recycling and composting facility. Um, so public-private partnership. We have also our regional facility, so we get material from uh, other jurisdictions around the North Bay and Bay Area, not just um, from Napa, but kind of a, around the region. So a regional facility. So we are accepting material for both recycling and composting from several other communities. Um, we have done some upgrades to both sides. We're going to talk about recycling today. We have a lot of composting upgrades, but um, for recycling, some of those upgrades have included some uh, machinery that helps to sort cartons out. Um, we have been um is this working let's see there we go that's just a note that's just a picture of our facility you can see the murph one of the things about our murph and i think this is going to come up a lot when you see when you hear um some some tr trepidation um from facilities to recycle cartons is the space i mean our murph does not have a lot of space and you have very limited space in there to to sort material so we one of the things that we have always included in our program are cartons at least in the last 20 years since when it went single stream. And so we have had a space on a container line and a, and a specific shoot for cartons. Um, I'll talk about some of the challenges that we had to go and then kind of how we solved that over time. But that's been in there since our MRF was retrofitted. So you'll just have to figure out if your MRF's gonna take them and separate them um, from, you know, as their own grade, grade 52, as we call it. Um, there just has to be space to do it and then space outside to store it. You see our area for material storage. You have to have a, a 30 yard box typically to jump them into out there. Um, programs kind of, you gotta, if you're gonna recycle something effectively, I think we all know that you have to have consistent messaging. And so this is just a kind of an, an example of how we message our programs to folks. And so we have an image of both an aseptic and a gable top on our in mold graphics and our um, and our outreach materials, and it's been there, you know, through different variations. But this is our current kind of SB thirteen eighty three compliant signage that's on all our recycling. Um, so we include it on there. Um, it does act as a container on the line, and I think that's how we've always sorted it as a container. That's where it was been has been sorted. It doesn't end up with our mixed paper, so we've never sent it out in mixed paper bales, understanding that other facilities may be different, but we've always sorted it as its own commodity, partially because it's three-dimensional and it ends up with those bottles and cans kind of on that line where we sort containers. So I talked about traditionally what we did. We actually hand sorted cartons for um, you know 15 years or so on our container line. And in our MRF retrofits of the last few years, we actually have added now three of these um, robots. And so one of the things that we were having a problem with, and this is the issue with low volume commodities, is it takes you a long time to generate a full truck load so that we can send it to the port and recycle it. And cartons were like particularly problematic because if we had bales of cartons that sat in our yard outside for like six months, they start to turn yellow, grow mold, and that degrades the fiber. And the fiber is a really high value white paper fiber but not after it sits around for too long. And we were having a hard time moving loads because we didn't have enough of it in a, um, 
And so what we've done is we've added technology here to sort more cartons from our load. And then we've kind of partnered, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, second part of it with the Carton Council on a milk run where we are picking up um, carton bales from other MRFs to kind of get more cartons so we can ship them um, in a shorter amount of time. So through partial grant funding from the Carton Council, um, right? So we um, have been working, talking to the Carton Council for years about this, um, kind of talking about our challenges. Um, we were able to add um, one of our robots um, and it was partially funded by the Carton Council, kind of funded to do carton collection, but also it does other things too, right? It, it sorts PET or HGPE as well. And so the Carton Council helped to fund part of this robot. And um, this is just kind of a picture of the line. Um, you know, it's, a, it's coming in there, cartons, bottles and stuff. Instead of having a person who was, the issue with having a person do it is it wasn't a full person's job. So the person was kind of multitasking and sorting other commodities. And I think we've noticed over time with having the robot, you know, more picks, um, we've been able to deploy our human sorters to do other things. Um, we've been able to get more cartons off the line with the robot than we used to. We've seen it in our volume. Um, the other interesting thing about cartons, which I mentioned, I didn't have a slide in here. Um, here's kind of a picture in the side of the roll off box. And then on the right hand side, you see the bales of cartons. Um, you know, there is a portion of the cartons that are aseptic cartons. Um, you know, they were always hand sorted by the same in the same place, but what we figured out is during our um, our retrofits of our MRF is that the we added a new eddy current. You know, an eddy current is a reverse magnet, right? That's designed to sort aluminum, um, and the new ones are really strong, and they tend to, you know, they push away, right? Their reverse magnet. Um, anything that has any type of non-ferrous, um, non-magnetic metal in them. So along with aluminum cans and aluminum foil, we were also getting brass, doorknobs, or license plates, things like that, and aseptic cartons um, onto our conveyor from our eddy current. Actually, a lot of aseptic cartons, way more than we really realized were going down there. And so we actually have a, a person on a little secondary conveyor who then sorts the aluminum, right? They let the aluminum cans go by into the bunker, but then they sort out the non, the random scrap metal to recycle that. And then, but separately from aluminum cans, and then also the aseptic cartons. And we're, um, we're getting a decent amount, I think about 30 tons a year of aseptics that come from our aluminum sorting process, which was something we didn't really realize, but because of that, what is it, 6%, 4% of that carton that's aluminum, that gets it, you know, <laughs> kind of, uh, the eddy grabs it and, and identifies it and through its sorting process. We put those cartons right, that's a really clean stream right back in and mix it with the gable tops. And so that's just added to our volume, which has been good. Um, and uh, we're looking at maybe trying to figure out if there's any kind of robotics that would help there. Although right now it's a challenge to find a robot that will pick scrap metal. If they're actually, robots are really good at picking cartons because of the flat surfaces, um, actually better than picking plastic bottles I've noticed. Um, and I think it's just a simpler, it's simpler to identify a carton than the various types of polypropylene, HGP, PET. So um, I think for a human or a mechanical sorter, there are those that's a little bit simpler to pull a car in. So that's been good. Um, we'll see if there's any way to, to um, do a robot to, to kind of pull our aseptics on that line. And uh, cause we're looking at, you know, using our staff and all the places that we can use people. People are really good at certain things and we need to have them around operating equipment and all those other fun things. So that's just, I mean, then once we have bales, right? We have a full load of bales. Um, our bales have been going out for years now to that Kimberly Clark mill in Mexico. Um, the challenges for us have, you know, just in the last few years were related to getting shipping containers, just like a lot of commodities. That's actually cleared up. We've been able to move material a lot better in the last year or so. So that hasn't been as much of an issue as it was during kind of peak COVID. Um, you know, one of the part, the partnership, the kind of second partnership we have with the Carden Council is the Milk Run. Um, happy to talk to specific MRFs or communities about this. And this was just the idea of being able to go to places where it was going to take too long to generate a full load of cartons, like like it was at our MRF. And going, and we'll go out and pick up, you know, four to eight carton bales from a MRF, bring it back, consolidate it and ship and how that's funded. I mean, the Carton Council pays us a little bit of money to help with the shipping. And then we purchase the cartons, you know, with a market price from MRFs 
and bring that back. And then we sell the cartons. And so that's how we kind of make money off of it as well. And so it's helped us generate uh, full loads faster. We'd love to have more participants. I think it's been more of a challenge than a lot of us first thought to get MRFs on board. I'm sure we can talk about there's all kind of the, the challenges with just adding a commodity and finding a space and people to to do that on the line. But we're we offer that service throughout the, you know, to MRFs in the Bay Area or the kind of Northern California region. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of can go up and pick up cartons as part of this milk run. Um, so yeah, I don't want to take too much time. I think it'll be good to have a conversation, answer um, questions. But we, you know, we basically have had it as part of our programs, and um, it's kind of one of those things that fits in there. It's not a huge vol volume, but it's one of the core material types. Um, I think we've gotten to the point over time that um, aseptics are now. I think a lot of folks knew about the gable tops for a while. Aseptics was a little bit more confusing, we've added that picture. We've kind of tried to make sure that folks know that, that they can put those in there too. Um, it all gets recycled together. Um, and uh, it's in a pretty stable place as kind of part of what we sort on the line. Um, you know, the value of the commodity is not super high, but it's consistent. And so that's really what the most important thing is for a recycling program is consistency, knowing you can sort it, and then there's a place to send it to recycle it. Um, so that's stuff that we've always been able you, that's that all those questions have been helped out by some of these partnerships that we've had. So, yeah, I can look in the chat and know we're going to have a round table and um, but that's all I had for now. Tim, that's great. Uh, before we kind of open it up to general discussion, I wanted to see if there were folks here. Um, and I think I counted about six or seven folks that represent either processors or recyclers who um, have had experience. Uh, with uh, carton recycling, and I just wanted to, you know, give you you all a chance to kind of weigh in and uh, share your experiences. So, does anybody want to uh, you go ahead and unmute or raise your hand um, and just say, you know, what have been the issues? I had a lot of great conversations with folks before this webinar with haulers and processors about some of the constraints and some of the opportunities. I think one of the key issues is that. Um, they can't always justify the cost of um, separating the materials because their um, their communities are not necessarily supporting them in that cost. So I think that would be a thing to think about. You know, um, if we want, if we are negotiating a new contract, negotiating a new processing contract, making sure that if we want to see the highest and best use of materials that are in our discard stream diverted from disposal, we need to send the signal to our haulers and processors that. Um, you know, that will be willing to pay for that expense uh, rather than expect them just to go on, you know, spot prices and other things. So that economics of recycling is something that I think communities, when they're negotiating contracts, need to keep in mind. Hey, Ted, welcome. You want to weigh in? Thanks, Ruth. Yeah, um, I just wanted to mention that as in rural Del Norte County here, uh, we were recycling cartons for a while as part of our curbside program back when we had a local recycling processor. And even when it was included in the general family of materials included in our uh, curbside recycling, our population in our rural areas is not such that we could accumulate enough cartons that they could be bailed and shipped in a way that the recyclers would actually use them. And so I want everybody to know really clearly, I know that everybody who wants to have cartons included in the recycling programs wants to have that be universal. So if you say cartons are recyclable anywhere in California, they're recyclable everywhere in California. And to me, that implies a responsibility for the Carton Council to address this fundamental issue. The, that it may cost you more to make sure that these things are recyclable in rural areas, but if you don't put that money out or put it, the systems in place to actually get those recycled, then I am not willing to tell our customers to put them in the recycling bin so that they can be sorted out and disposed later. That's not okay. So um, just making it really clear, I will not tolerate BS on this. We all want to see recycling work, but that sometimes costs money and it's not always the local governments who are going to be footing the bill for disingenuous outreach and education. We need to solve this problem at a fundamental level, and I need everybody to buy in on that. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Ted. I, um, 
Tim, you kind of addressed the issue that the materials can degrade. I did have a conversation with a MRF that had been recycling cartons and stopped recycling cartons because it kind of took them a year to accumulate enough and they were aging. What is the, um, what's the age of a carton that makes it no longer marketable? Is that something that you've come across, Tim? I think, I think it depends on how you store them and the time of year. We found that like after like two or three months, it was getting to be too long. We're trying to move every six to eight weeks at this point, um, and it's still fine. So, I mean, it does have a liner that helps it. It doesn't just immediately degrade, but it was when they start to turn yellow um, is, the, is the problem, right? Because that messes with the, the color of the fiber, especially if it's going to make tissue products. So this is kind of where, you know, the Carton Council is here and knows this, and they've, they're trying to address this with milk run and i think it's this is an issue for low volume commodities um i'm fascinated to see how funding of of all packaging goes forward right with sb54 i mean i'm not gonna i think you know i would love to see cartons as part of the bottle bill i mean i'm going to always say that that's how you get you know a material <laughs> value um uh, high enough that MRFs are gonna sort it but if not if it's some other way to fund it and it just has to be a way that you know folks in all over the state can can so, can sort that out. And we're we're able to do it, understanding that in Del Norte it's a lot harder. Understanding that maybe in some cities they're going to put it with mixed paper. Like there doesn't have to be one 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 answer to it. But yeah, I mean Ted is right. It needs to you need to be able to do it. And I think the funding mechanism is still to be determined. But there needs to be funding. I don't think it should be coming from the MRFs or the jurisdictions to figure out how to fund any infrastructure um, like this to add, not just cartons, we could talk about all kinds of organics or other products. Um, so we'll see, but yeah, I mean, I think there's ways in the in the meantime, like to kind of get over some of these hurdles and get more of them sorted for sure. Good, good. And I did hear uh, that uh, as a part of the new amendment to the bottle bill, wine in cartons will become a part of the redemption value in uh, next year. So there you go. Okay. Um, Hey, Martin, welcome. What's uh, what's your experience? What's Thanks, yeah, uh, Martin Bork, Ecology Center. We're the curbside collector for the city of Berkeley. And I think uh, Jeff is on the call here from CCC as well. I'm not sure if that's right, Jeff, or not. <laughs> um, yeah, I can speak a little bit to, you know, some of the conversations that have happened in Berkeley over the years around, around cartons. And, you know, we've been approached by the council and others. Um, to try and add this material uh, to our program. Um, and uh, just note that for a while, it was uh, cartons were to go, at least the cable tops were to go to compost, which we found particularly problematic as we're just then spreading all the microplastic into our soil, <laughs> which doesn't seem like a good uh, end destination. But um, some of the issues, you know, that have been discussed already in terms of being a small um, municipal MRF, uh, sorting cost, storage, um, just the, the basic mechanics and um, logistics and cost uh, have been um, prohibitive in the past. But also, you know, we are deeply concerned as an environmental organization about the um, end destination and, and final use of the materials not just can you move it which you know we're, and and we're still suffering from um the you know single stream surge in the 19 in the 2000s late 1990s 2000s and collect all plastics programs that said look if you collect enough of any one of these things you, there'll be a market for it of course it was bullshit and ended up causing great harm in uh, other countries particularly china uh, where a lot of this stuff was dumped and burned um, for, for a decade. And we're finally seeing a drop off of that. But our, our big concern um, with a lot of the plastic packaging, and I, you know, I, I, this is a mixed material, of course, but some of it up to a quarter of the weight is um, PE. And so that's a big percentage and one of, of concern as is the aluminum linings in, in some of them. And so, um, uh, you know, ongoing and repeat conversation that's, that's happened in Berkeley is around, well, what's going to happen to it once it gets to its final destination? And currently, my understanding is that um, cartons are, you know, they're not officially part of our collection program. Of course, we'd get some. My understanding is that they do go out in the mixed paper. Um, and 
our mix paper is exported to um, Thailand, as I understand it. You know, it used to go to China, some of the biggest mills in the world, most modern, able to handle um, mixed um, MRF paper, uh, probably in the best way on the planet at the time. <laughs> it's not the case with a lot of these mills that are now not going to, not in China and going to mills that were built for um, tropical hardwood. Um, so what do they do with, with this um, carton? And my guess with the experience that I have in the field is that most of the, anything that's not immediately, you know, going into their um, feeding directly into the pulp is getting pulled out and burned to fuel their um, power plant, um, you know, to fuel the paper making process, which is incredibly energy intensive process. So they may not reject these cartons because they're actually a good fuel. <laughs> Um, so, which is, you know, really concerning in terms of what happens to those local communities, where's this fuel to waste to energy that was in three or four of those boxes, um, and in terms of what happens, you know, in the yield question, um, that's deeply concerning to us, to our constituents, to, uh, you know, from an environmental and, and um, environmental justice, uh, lens. And, um, you know, when we were told in the past, look, there's good markets for three through seven plastics, you know, that turned out to be a temporary and a, a joke. And now we're still dealing with trying to have to re-educate the public about what is and actually isn't recyclable. So we're very cautious about adding new materials um, and, you know, take to heart that like one market does not a market maker, whatever the quote was, like we would, would really want to see good markets where we know there's a separation and actually recycling of that plastic and aluminum as opposed to it just going up in a smokestack. Um, in, in, you know, whether that's in country here, because, you know, a lot of plastic residual can go to a cement kiln, even in developed nations, and get burned as, as fuel and not be classified as waste to energy. Um, so, you know, a lot of questions, a lot of concerns about that. Don't want to tell our customers and the broader consumer base, hey, cartons are totally great, environmentally safe um, packaging if what's really happening is what Ted described, where it's getting sorted out and set to landfill, which is a kind of a best case scenario, in my opinion, or it's getting sorted out <clears throat> and being burned for, for fuel. Um, the last thing I'll just say is we do have some questions about these end markets in terms of like, embedding plastic and mixed plastic and paper into the built environment. And, um, you know, roof paper um, doesn't seem like a particularly great environmental final product. Um, from my perspective, I don't know that much about it, but I'd, I'd like to know um, to know more. So anyways, I've, I've said a lot, so I'll just Thanks take so any much, responses Martin. or comments offline. Yeah. Uh, I also did want to, um, you know, say that part, you know, and I'd be interested in Susan and Tom's perspective on the mixed paper road to recycling for cartons and whether that's extremely viable in the California marketplace where those materials are going. But um, it sounds like if you can get into a grade 52, it's more likely to go to a mill that will actually have the um, capacity to actually, you know, uh, pulp it. And um, I know I see Mike was here in terms of uh, the idea of a secondary MRF in the Bay Area. Um, you know, a lot of uh, the smaller MRFs don't necessarily have the person power or the equipment to separate a lot of potentially recyclable materials, including polypropylene. And is it better for us to um, equip all of those uh, MRFs with all of the equipment that's needed? Even they may not have the space, they may not have the time or energy and effort, or uh, would um, processing of MRF residuals or uh, three through seven plastics or cartons be a viable op opportunity. Mike, did you want to kind of weigh in on that? Do you have a perspective? And then we'll go back, go back to you, Ted. Sure. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, we uh, started a secondary MRF in 2009 or 10. And, and the reason we did is a lot of the things that everybody's been bringing up, low volume materials, hard to recycle materials, and materials that uh, were in the stream, but were not, there was no end markets for them. And so the question was how to deal with those in the most cost-effective manner. And, uh, you know, that's been a struggle. I think the secondary MRF is the least cost method to do that, but it's not necessarily uh, free given our, the way our systems are set up today. It still would cost more at the curb, 
or it would cost more from the end users, but someone's gonna have to cover that cost. But the end result would be we uh, sorted uh, several single stream MRF residual lines. And we define residual as everything the primary MRF cho chooses not to sort. Now I'm fine with them sorting it. And a lot of them can sort truckload quantities, but if you can't make a truckload quantity in a month, then there's probably no room for you to sort it or to store it. And the quality of that material will degrade over time. So you're much better off sending that out consolidated and choose not to sort that and send it to a regional center that could sort it. That, that's been our experience, what we learned. Uh, we would still, uh, we, our cost is between uh, three to six cents a pound to sort that material. But we, uh, we did a great job. We sorted four truckloads a month of cartons, uh, six truckloads a month of polypropylene, uh, one truckload a month of expanded polystyrene, polystyrene. We sorted, we could sort PL, uh, PLA, uh, we could sort uh, a PETG. So we really could dig deeper in the stream. And our intent was to create consistent, predictable truckload quantities that is respect so that end users could recycle it. I think Martin brought up a good point. We want to know where this material is going after we recycle it. And the intent would be if you got a predictable and consistent stream of these materials that met is respect, then you will create the uh, end use for that material. We have a really problem in this area as to the chicken or the egg, you know, what comes first? Uh, do you sort it and create truckload quantities or do you create an end market? And uh, typically you've got to do a little bit of both. And I'm encouraged in California because we have SB 54 coming up and that's going to put a value on these materials. And that's going to give uh, incentive for all parties to pull it together. Our model was very driven by the MRFs. We wanted to be connected to the MRF industry where we would take what they choose not to sort. We would design a system to sort for approximately 9 million residents in the Bay Area. And that would be about 9,000 pounds a month, uh, 9,000 tons a month of material. Uh, we were uh, very close to closing this deal right before COVID and uh, create a, a, a system in the Bay Area. And unfortunately, COVID put it on hold. We uh, had funding that dried up. And now the cost to set a site like this has gone up at least 60%. Uh, you know, you guys probably see what's happened with the rates for rental, renting property in the Bay Area. Uh, and it's the same in the Reno Tahoe area and the same in the Empire Valley. They've literally doubled in the last 18 months. So that makes the cost structure uh, even more difficult. We could make it work because we had CRV value in the other commodities. So in California, we were planning on doing this to showcase it. And then it would be a lot cheaper to do it in other regional markets. And it doesn't really help Ted's situation very much because this is more a, a large metro area solution because you would draw from like 10 MRFs to justify the cost. And then our intent was to share the revenue back to the MRFs. And by doing that, the MRFs would be competitive in defining their contracts with the cities. And you know, for me, I pay 50 bucks a month to get three pickups a week, green waste, recyclables, and trash. And they also pick up at least once a quarter, you know, electronics, trash, hazardous waste, all for 50 bucks a month. You know, and, you know, if we added this regional facility as part of the MRF infrastructure and it was part of the rates, I'm anticipating the rate would go up three bucks a month. That's it. Because we're only talking about closing the loop on about 10 percent of what the consumer puts in there. And I'll bring up one other point why I like why I think this is an inflectionary period and maybe SP 54 will finally help bring this solution you know, to the market is that if you look at the weight of curbside single stream from 27, 20, 20, uh, 12, or actually let's go 2014 to now, it's gone down from 67 pounds a month per average to 40 pounds a month per average. So, and then the value of curbside single stream has dropped in half in, since 2017. And I would recommend you look at the Recycling Partnership 2020 report. It's, you can Google it. 
and you can read about the detriment of this stream and how low in value it's getting and how uh, how low in volume it's getting. You know, we can't have a Teamster driver picking up air. And so we need to have cartons in the system. We need to have a whole bunch of other things in this system if we're going to uh, eventually, you know, have a robust recycling program. But uh, we are asking a lot of the MRFs to not only take product in that is inelastic, it goes every day, no matter what, they get that material in, regardless that there's a port strike, regardless that there's a China green fence, regardless of the market's dump because we thought we were shipping to nine mills in China and we were only shipping to one guy, Xi Jinping, and he said no more. You know, that happened in 2019. So, you know, these MRFs have to deal with all these changes and then to add to it, okay, we want you to recycle PLA because we don't want to compost cartons because we don't want it in compost, uh, uh, PETG because we don't want it in PET, PET clamshells because we can't have those in the PET either. And uh, and now I think we have to start addressing, um, you know, the the, uh, the flexible packaging, which is also another big volume that that is going to be very difficult for MRFs to deal with. So this solution is a regional solution that would take, require a lot of cooperation. And unfortunately, I haven't been able to garner it, <laughs> but I've been trying. And uh, we're, we're hoping that, you know, forums like this, where you have a product that's low to, low volume recyclable, that the MRF can do exactly what Tim's doing, which is recycle it. But if he, if he can't, there's an outlet. And not only for that, but for everything else that that MRF is not designed to sort, or for one reason or another, you know, has a yield loss issue because they have to stay within compliance. You know, if they have a bad day, they still have to get all that materials processed. So that's my two cents on this. I am a big fan of the Carton Council. They've been very supportive of the secondary process. They looked at it as a, re a recovery uh, up add-on to their system. Obviously, they'd rather have the MRFs do it because the closer to the problem, the better. But if not, we're a catch-all and we can uh, sort those effectively and make a good quality product. So. I've enjoyed my relationship with all of the Carton Council, and I think they've done a good job. And we need more of these advocates for these low volume packaging to move it forward. Um, so I like, I think you're a part of the solution, uh, certainly not part of the problem. So that's my two hey, cents. Mike, thank you for all that great info. Um, so uh, let's go back to Ted, and then we'll go to Susan. And then if you want to kind of pipe in anybody with a question or a comment or additional discussion, go ahead and raise your hand and we'll line you up. So, Ted. Yeah, I just wanted to add, uh, uh, since several folks have mentioned SB 54 and the circular economy, to me, one of the fundamental challenges of moving towards a circular economy is clearly separating what is recyclable and what is compostable. And as long as you have a composite material of any kind, the pr manufacturers of that composite material, to me, are equally fiscally responsible for the separation, the clear and absolute separation of organic recyclable materials from, uh, I'm sorry, organic compostable materials from actually recyclable materials and keeping those separations clear. And so as long as a manufacturer of any product wants to combine the organic and the recyclable stream, it is incumbent upon them to then effectively make that separation clear and obvious so you can go back those materials to markets or compost. And so as long as the Carton Council, the Aseptic Packaging Council, anybody wants to combine organic recyclable materials with, uh, I'm saying organic compostable materials with recyclable materials or disposable materials, it is incumbent upon them to how are those materials going to be separated prior to being put back on the market. That's it. You got to do the whole thing. You got to do it everywhere. You can't do it. This is where it's going to make sense. This is how it works for us because it's already worked for you. We've got these as existing litter problems along the roadsides. We've got costs from a municipal perspective. We've got environmental costs. These things to me, the, the right place to seek recompense for those things are the people who have made product, who have made profit off of the manufacture and the distribution of those materials. Thank you. Susan, let's go ahead and have you uh, have a capping comment here. And then we just have a few announcements before we wrap up. Great, thanks. And what I would like to do, instead of trying to tackle all the different great comments that have been made, is to reflect on what's happening in Oregon, because 
uh, the, they are really coming at this to tackle many of the things that Martin raised as concerns. And they're in the process of creating the regulatory environment that requires those producers, that requires the end markets, that require the MRFs to all align in a regulatory process that in order to participate, all of those pieces must be aligned. So, you know, for example, if material goes to Vietnam, those Vietnamese mills have to have a third party audit and have to report if that material is going to be considered recyclable in the program. And if the MRF sells to them, if they want to be reimbursed, they have to have sold to a, a end market that is meeting the requirements of Oregon's broader, broader regulatory environment. So I think there's a lot to this. And as California moves forward with SB 54, looking to the level of detail, and I believe the goals are very much aligned with pretty much everything you said, Martin, um, that puts the burden on this, on the uh, creates a broader format to address those as opposed to us trying to, on a one-off, try to second guess what's happening. Um, and it's, I think the, it will be incumbent upon all the different pieces of the value chain. If they want to participate, they're going to have to meet those requirements. So I think what I will do, I, I mean, one thing I was just going to also say is I did, and I think technology is going to be really important in that. I want to make one comment yesterday when I was at this mill we spent about 20 minutes out, maybe a half an hour out looking at their residual piles and they put new technology in their pulping. I found one carton of the, I mean, it was days of residual, one carton in their pulping residual. I found a lot of aluminum cans, a lot of plastic film, a lot of pouches, a lot of rigid plastic bottles. And I looked, we looked, that was what we looked everywhere. We found one, so I guess I would say I think technology really, as it evolves and more more recent technology goes into the pulping industry as well. That's one piece of that value chain, but I think we can't discount the value of all of the advances being made, and they are being made. We need to recognize we can't be um, assuming what was ten years ago is today, but we have to have proof, and we have to require the regulatory process to to demand that we are indeed participating to the integrity of this, uh, the, the uh, legislation that California has and that Oregon has to the future. And I'll leave it at that. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Susan. And thank you, everybody. I um, What we'll do is we'll uh, save the chat and we'll ask um, maybe Susan, Susan, Tom, Tim, kind of answer some of your questions offline. And then we'll just send that out to everybody that participated in the uh, the webinar today. But just by way of a kind of wrap up, we do have a few announcements, which is, hey, it's Zero Waste Youth Day of Action on Saturday. Y'all are invited. Um, we'll put the uh, link in the chat. But essentially, if you go on the Zero Waste Youth USA website, you can get to the Day of Action. That's going to come up on um, Saturday, the 25th. Then next week is Zero Waste Week in Northern California. Join us for a recycling update. It is both in person at the Marines Memorial in downtown San Francisco and online. You can join from afar, so please join us. That's next week on the 28th. And as a part of that, there'll be a Race to Zero Waste, which is awesome. It's a 5K fun fundraiser, and that's going to come up here on April 1st. So please join us for all these events. Our um, NICRA Schools Committee and our Zero Waste Food Committee will be getting together and offering a lot more webinars and info. So um, stay tuned, keep track of us. Uh, we would like to put all of our resources and share everything that you guys have online. We have a website at nicrarecycles.org. You can also join our schools committee. Maybe we'll talk about polypropylene next. Um, it's another problem product for our uh, schools that serve yogurt. And, uh, and you know, we've spent a lot of time, uh, and I saw Ben was here, uh, thinking about, well, if we can't get this stuff recycled, maybe we really got to focus on reuse. So we've had a lot of discussion and a lot of models on reusable foodware, reusable cups for milk, et cetera. So those might be things that we need to focus on as well. So keep in touch with the NICRA schools and thank you all for coming. We will put all of these resources on our website and um, really appreciate your participation today.